I have put on the final finishing touch to this massive uh, hardware software update that I've done to my little station area in here. I'll post it um, above here. Hopefully I don't forget to post it before I upload the video, but it is now done. My uh, second monitor was installed today. All the bling bling because I like it. Remember the difference between want and need. This was a want paid for in cash. All right. Anyways, um, the workspace is now done and I could not be happier. It's just going to make this so enjoyable for me. So anyways, I would like to thank you guys for just your unending patience while I have done all this upgrading over the last couple of months. Um, it's, I really appreciate the fact that you guys have stuck around through just all sorts of technical stuff, you know, bad microphone lighting. And sometimes the lighting isn't even always perfect. I've got the perfect lights, but you know, I just really appreciate you guys sticking around like you have as I've gotten this all done, but it is now officially done. I can celebrate. Yay. So, but I couldn't do it without you guys and your patience. So I really want to sincerely say, I thank you for that. Okay. All right. I'm Carrie. This is student loan chit chat. We're going to step back a little bit earlier today. All right. And, uh, your bedtime story tonight ran, let's see, 12 hours ago. Cause right now it's about nine 30. Um, should I get a prenup? Should I get a prenup? I'm hearing this for the very first time right along with you. Let's take this all the way on down. We take this down to the bottom of the screen. Don't forget also, you can now easily see over here, for those that might be new, this is the title. And of course, down here, it shows you when it ran. And I think those are some nice little tidbits to have. All right, folks, let's go ahead. Let's pour that tea. Thank you so much for being here with me. Brought to you by the Every Dollar app. Start budgeting for free today. Jesse is in Atlanta starting Hello, off this hour. Hello, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for taking my call. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? So my husband and I have, um, we read the total money makeover and we worked diligently to get out of debt. And thankfully now we've paid off our debts and we own our home. What? So Yay! Yay! Good job, Jesse. Good job, husband. <laughs> Go. We are now in the process. Thank you. Uh, it was actually through your book. God did amazing things through you. Um, but so now we're in the process of looking towards wealth building. And because of that, I've been looking at uh, podcasts and different videos on wealth building. But I've been noticing a recurring theme among a lot of these very well-known people. And it's that they use these phrases. Everybody has a prenup, either the government makes one or you make one yourself. Um, and I have always been someone that thinks very negatively towards prenups. My husband and I, when we were married, granted we were broke, but we always felt that the word divorce was out of the question and that if you're even considering a prenup, then you're opening yourself up to the possibility of a divorce. So I wanted your opinion as a Christian, as somebody who is wealthy, what is your uh, perspective on prenups? I don't think anybody gets married with the intent of divorcing. I shouldn't know. Can't say anybody. I don't think most people do. Unless you're just out to marry somebody for their wealth. And you have an extreme amount of wealth. You know, you're marrying Celine Dion. You're marrying Barbara Streisand. Okay. Um, I have mixed feelings about prenups. I, I don't think it's a one. I don't think it's going to be a one size fits answer for everybody especially in the, in the Christian realm. So it's more in theory because it obviously doesn't apply to you all. Co correct. But to and what does prenup really, uh, I mean, what does it really have to do with being Christian or not? I mean, I, I can respect and see where she might say, you know, according to this religion, what is prenups? But when you get right down to it, I, I, to me, religion would not matter. I guess the reason that I'm asking it is because I, I it kind of, helps me in discerning are these people that I should get advice from like yeah. wealth building is this people that I should be listening to well I, I don't know who you're listening to and don't tell me but um uh typically what happens in something like that is a financial person is uh, financial people and uh legal people both uh, are the world's worst and I, I had to break myself of this when I started doing this several years ago are the world's worst at looking at life through only one lens 
okay? Mm -hmm. You're asking a question through a relational lens, a spiritual lens, and a wealth building and legal lens. They're Mm -hmm. only looking at it for wealth protection. Well, if you kind of get down to it, that is what it's about when you put the hammer on the nail. Right? Um, to, to that That's ultimately what it's about. I kind of look at it like insurance. Okay? And if you've watched this channel before, um, you know that I used to work in the insurance industry. Insurance can look at, we can look at other areas, but when you get right down to it, it's do you have coverage? It's the same thing with prenup. Do you have coverage? Yeah, I understand that this caused this, this caused that. There's a whole chain of reaction. Think of it kind of like um, a uh, freeway accident. God help us. Okay. But it's the best analogy I can think of, right? You know, at 9.45 at night. Uh, on work nights, I will not be filming at 9.45. <laughs> um, well, actually, technically, it is a work night, but I don't get up early to exercise on Monday, so we're cool. But think of it like a major freeway accident, okay? Lots and lots of interlinked and uh, relationships between what car hit, you know, the other car. But when you get right down to it, one car started that accident. And religion, belief, and anything else doesn't matter. One car actually started that chain of events. And that's how an insurance policy is determined. Prenups, to me, can have all sorts of things involved. Okay? It can talk about family. It can talk about children. You know, where you want to go, where you've been. It, It can do all. It could talk about religion. Okay, it could consider family dynamics. But when you get down to what a prenup actually is in terms of insurance, it's to protect one's wealth, period. Whose wealth? That's variable. It can change. But right down to it, it's about protecting one person's wealth. Actually, both people's wealth. Whether you're rich or poor, it's both people's wealth. (laughs) If, If you could live a life, which you can't, that wealth protection was separated from your relationships and was separated from your spiritual walk, you can't. But if you could, then a prenup would be a slam dunk. And in their minds, therefore, a prenup is a slam dunk. But I would assuming that a prenup would be done by attorneys. And attorneys, and I don't know anything about law, but I'm assuming that attorneys have to really stay in line with the law. Okay, there, there can't be a whole lot of interpretations. So if somebody wants a prenup and you want to consider all these other things, that's fine. But in the end, it, in the final analysis, it may not have anything directly to do with the law. And decisions that are made must be based on law, not on one spiritual, personal, religious walk in life. Because they only see it through that lens. Does that make sense? Yes. So I wouldn't necessarily discredit them uh, for all of their advice as somehow being a heresy or something like that. I would just say whoever you're listening to is only looking at the advice they're giving through a singular lens. Our approach is we believe that personal finance is 80% behavior, and we've proven that. It's not about math, and it's not about that stuff. So uh, our approach is, is that the prenup actually could end up uh, stunting your growth. Be- or you write a prenup, but because it's based 80% on behavior and not on what's actually legal, the prenup gets challenged and is no good. This is why to me, if you're going to have a prenup, it needs to be based on the law. We can't, we can't be, I don't, if I have to have a prenup, okay. And I, I'm not for or against prenups to be totally honest um, I don't need a prenup but then I come with very little wealth so to speak yeah I got a paid off condo okay but um but you know if the guy had more than I did and it made him more comfortable to sign a prenup cool you know I'm not going to be one of those women who winds up you know on uh uh, what what is it one of those channels TLC screaming over a prenup I'm not going to do that (laughs) Because you're not all in on working together. See, now I disagree. Okay. If somebody wants me to sign a prenup, I'll sign it. I can tell you from my end, only speaking for myself, it's not going to lessen the effort of what I put into a relationship. 
It's just, it's not going to lessen it. I'm not going to say, oh, I have a prenup, so I need to work harder, or I don't have a prenup, so what is it? If I, if I'm, if there is a prenup and I'm the poor person, you know, I got to work harder to make sure he doesn't leave. Or if there's not a prenup and I'm the poor person, that means I can take it easy. I, I don't think like that. And, and hopefully by the time you got to the altar, you would have an idea as to what your potential partner would think about prenups. Like I said, I'm not for them and I'm not against them. I'll, I'll kind of leave that one open to the individual couple. So okay, when, I I really show, when I first started the show, when I first started the show, I was 100% never get a prenup under any circumstances. Don't get married if you love your stuff more than you love her. Period. Mm -hmm. Just don't do it. That's how I started. Now, having done this a long time, I have one caveat that I've added about a decade ago to this. And that is if two people are getting married, one of them has extreme wealth. There's an extreme difference like I had one guy uh, who was marrying a lady who had $10 million and he didn't have two nickels. Okay. I suggested a prenup to them uh, to keep their relationship pure about relationship and not about money. And I could, I could respect if someone had that big of a difference, but maybe it's the less, I'm not overly religious. Like, yeah, you know, I believe in, you know, God and all that stuff. Okay. I'm Christian, uh, baptized in the Methodist church. Uh, okay. So, uh, I like to look at it as kind of a liberal Christian. Okay. I'm not overly religious. All right. Um, but I do believe, okay. But I, I could, I could respect that if somebody had, you know, that much money, but if I'm marrying someone, regardless of their wealth, um, I, I'm not going to reject you. If you want me to sign a prenup, I'll sign it. It's like, if, if, if that makes you feel better, we can move on with life. And the <laughs> bigger reason I suggested to them is my now experience 30 years later has been the prenup in that case is not really for that couple. It's for all the weirdos in their families. Because all of a sudden, crazy mother-in-law swoops in from the other side once the $10 million golden goose shows up. Or you could just lie and say you have a prenup. It's kind of like with my little baking business, okay? And people, you know, I was saying it earlier in another video, you know, somebody wants you to bake the cake for free and then they'll pay you. And I just, very easy answer. I simply say, I'm sorry, I'm filed with the, with the IRS so that I'm paid first. I'm not filed as a billing company with the IRS. And I, if I file as a billing company, then I have to change my tax status. So since I'm built as a pay up front, uh, service, you know, I have to be able to show that you paid me first and then I made the product, not that I made it. And then you billed me because that could get me in trouble with the IRS. This would be a great excuse. Okay. Just tell the in-laws, sorry, it's in the prenup. <laughs> I could just, sorry, can't get you that Christmas cruise you wanted. It's in the prenup. <laughs> Everybody in the family is limited to one present. It's in the prenup. Oh, you could have some serious fun with that. And you got to look at then you got a little piece of paper and you look at her and go, sorry, ma, got a prenup. Can't do nothing. <laughs> Don't ask us. You can't ask me for a loan. It's in the prenup. Oh, I could have fun with that. I swear. And so it gives them a defense mechanism against crazy in their family. Because one thing we know about wealth is it magnifies everything. And that includes crazy. Yeah. Wealth. All wealth does is make you more of what you are. All wealth does is make you more of what you are. It does not, it, it doesn't change you. If you were, if you were status oriented and you were the type that, you know, what the neighbors think and feel and how everybody, you know, you're, you're worried about your image. Okay. All money is going to do is give you more to worry about your image. So you try to make a bigger image. Okay. If you're very charitable, you're giving, whether it's of your money or your time, I don't believe you have to just give up your money. Okay. It's just going to give you more opportunity to do that. If you were going to ask someone, however, okay, let's say you have a considerable amount. I don't have enough wealth to ask anyone to sign a prenup. I mean, I guess if, you know, I wanted to marry the gas station attendant who's, you know, 50 years old and, you know, has zero, I know, I guess I could look wealth. Well, wealth is all relative. It, it's really all relative. I mean, yeah, there, there's a mathematical tax 
return, I'm sure, identification of what wealth is, okay? Uh, when we talk about wealthy people, but I, in the end, wealth is all dependent upon who you are marrying. And I think it's also dependent upon, you know, not all wealth is up front, okay? Um, I stand to be in much better position financially retired than I am working. Because I'll be able to draw from pension. I'll be able to draw from Social Security. I know everybody says Social Security won't be around. Guys, they've been saying that since, you know, I was a teenager. Okay, so um, and I'll be able to draw from my own uh, private savings account, which should be in the six figures since I got 12 years to build it. All right. So this is why I'm so grateful. I have time on my side and I'm being very aggressive with it. But when it really comes down to it, wealth is all so individual between the two people. And not everybody's wealth is up front in liquid cash. There can be hidden wealth in other ways that comes due later. So when you got crazy members in your family and you marry $10 million, dad gum, the crazy comes out, you know? So in that case, I did recommend a prenup in extreme differences, but from 99% of the people, just regular folk getting married. And, you know, I had one lady call me up one time and said her, boyfriend had a 1968 frame up restoration mustang and he wanted a prenup oh have your damn car i don't care <laughs> take the car take the car i don't drive cars i don't I, mean, I drive a car but i don't collect cars i don't maintain cars you wouldn't even have to have that in the prenup buddy honey you, you can just have the car okay just just have the car it, that would be <laughs> like me saying and i don't want you to take my youtube computer station <laughs> I get all the monitors, everyone. I want the 35 inch, the 32 inch, and the 25 inch. <laughs> and don't forget the two laptops. <laughs> and you know, my answer to that is don't marry this bozo. He loves his car more yeah. than you. I don't know if I would jump that fast and say don't marry them. I, I mean, it, like I said, this just, it's so dependent. And, and it's dependent upon the approach, it's dependent upon the attitude of the person. Um, I would hope that before somebody would ask me to marry them and to protect the one, you know, materialistic thing, I would hope that we knew each other well enough to even know whether or not that was an appropriate thing to ask. Okay. Um, that, that's just, just, you know, what I think. You know, that's not, that's the, that's the answer to that. And that's not a. You know, that might not jive with these other guys, podcasts or whoever it is you're listening to. But but I do agree with Dave. In extreme wealth, someone is worth millions and my little butt is worth like uh, nothing. OK, I, I could respect that. I can respect that. But I think he's right. For the majority of people, no, no. But um, most of the time, I agree with where you're coming from, Jesse, and that is the prenup is simply planning the divorce in advance. Oh, 52% oh, of the marriages end in divorce. No, they don't. No, they don't. Not when you take out people with four-year degrees. Not when you take out people who regularly attend a house of worship. Not when you take out people who the parents on neither side were divorced. When you take those statistics out, almost 90% of the people make their marriage work. Oh, and you're, after, you're older than 22 years old, and you didn't have a baby before marriage. You can take these things out. Boom, 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 boom. Success rate of marriage goes way up. You make $50,000 a year or more household income. You didn't have a baby before marriage. You didn't get married in high school. You know, all these kinds of... I met every one of those things, and it's, I still effed it up. <laughs> uh, I didn't ask for the divorce. I know 80% of women are the ones who asked for it. I didn't ask for it. Didn't have a baby. Got married at 36. Made 50000 okay, and my income at the time, 50000 plus, right? Uh two degrees and the debt to prove it till it was forgiven. Let's see what else. Um, well, whatever other, yeah, I, I met all those. So even meeting all those guarantees, nothing guarantees, nothing. You take all that crap out. You got about a 90% survival rate of marriages. Oh, great. I landed in the 10%. <laughs> so that 52% figure includes a whole bunch of other crap going on of people who weren't going to make it anyway. So you can't use 52% of the marriages in the divorce because they really don't. Jesse, I'm going to ask Dave a question on your behalf. Is that cool? Are you safe? Oh, we just love to rib John about this. We, lo we love you, John. We just love to rib you about it. Cool. 
Yeah. Wait, uh, so wait, Dave, hold on, let me, hold on. Let me back. Really let me, don't. Let me back it up. Jesse, I'm going to ask Dave a question on your behalf. Is that cool? Yeah. Um, so, Dave, let me uh, throw a caveat in here. Tell me what you think about this. Um, a 55-year-old who's done pretty well, not extreme wealth, um, spouse passes away, and a, marries a 57-year-old who's done pretty well, spouse passes away. Both have kids, both have cousins. Does it make sense in that situation, again, to protect from family? And, if, and you, if you wanted to, but you've just got to be very careful because it's uh, you're, you're entering, you're, you're trying to say this stuff, the distribution of this stuff is more important than this relationship. And man, that's dangerous. It's in, in the end, I can tell you, I would not want to sign a prenup. In the, it, you know, in the final analysis, in the end, I would like to not sign a prenup. You know, if I, if I marry somebody, he's going on to this place. You know, th th this becomes our place. We can choose to stay here for a while, sell it. I'm never going to become a landlord. So that's not an option. I have no desire to ever be a landlord. Oh, hell no. Um, COVID convinced me that after the landlord, with all the landlords, they messed over with the moratorium and don't pay rent, you know? Um, so no, I have no desire to be a landlord. But if we get married, he, he's being put on this place. So my expectation is I'm not going to marry someone unless I want him to be a co-owner of this place. If I tell you I'll make you co-owner of my place, you know I love you. So if you don't have an ex basically, if you don't have an exit ramp, we got to figure this out. Yeah. we got to figure it out. Yeah, a good, I mean. I would think in that case, for both of you, because you each have kids and stuff, um, you could have a separate prenup I guess that would ensure that the children were taken care of you know whether it be life insurance policy stuff like that to make sure the kids are taken care of you know um it, it, I I could see that to protect the kids I I could definitely see that I don't have kids myself but um should I marry someone that has kids you know because I love that man I would expect and I would want him to have something in place to take care of his kids. And, um, and, and that's, and I don't have kids. So that, that to me is not an issue, but if I had kids, then we would do that for each other's kids. In this case, we would do it just for his. I would want that. There is no way I would want to marry someone and think his kids wouldn't have something from their father. If the father was in a financial position, do it. And if the relationship with the kids were such that the father wanted to do that, not all parents and kids have relationships. They just don't. That's just a matter of life. It's just a fact of life. If mm -hmm. you don't trust her to leave your Bible to your son from the first marriage, whose mom died, then don't marry her. Then don't marry her. Right. All right, folks, that is the end of this one. What time is it? It is a work night. It's 9.50. Folks, um, we are going to go ahead and call it a night. We are back to work schedule. Oh, heck, let's do one more. Let's just do one more. I already got it set up. I changed my mind. Okay. Hey, you got to, you know, this channel flows like the ebb, the web, and the tide. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and um, we're just going to go ahead and play this one. Why not? So for those of you that uh, want to go ahead and sign off for tonight's bedtime story, I really appreciate you being here. So everybody, let's wave goodbye to them. Bye. Okay. Don't forget to watch the rest of this tomorrow. For those of us that want to stick around, we're going to go ahead and do a second story. Now you got to realize when, when it comes to during the week, I can't guarantee we can always do second stories. I, I know uh, some of you guys, I think, really like the dual stories. Okay. Um, just if and when I have time. So that's the thing with this channel, especially keeping it non-monetized, all right? Um, it really has to just kind of flow when I can, all right? But uh, tonight, let's go ahead and I just changed my mind at the very last minute. You know, we women, we do that, okay? One minute's this answer, next minute's, oh, let's go do the next one. So for those of us who are sticking around for the second cup of tea, let's not even break. Let's just go ahead. Let's go straight into this, all right? Story number two. There's so much weirdness going on in this call. This is from about a year ago. Let me, I think I don't need to change anything. All right. So this is from a year ago, folks. Let's go ahead and hit it. Thanks for joining me. Peter is with us in Chicago. Hi, Peter. Hello, How are you? Peter. Hi, Dave. I'm good. How about yourself? Better than I deserve. What's up? <laughs> so uh, a little bit of background. Um, for the last three years since the pandemic, 
um, I have been paying for my parents' um, mortgage and home equity. Um, my I have been paying for my parents' um, mortgage and home equity. Okay, I, I had to rewind that. He's been paying for his parents' mortgage and home equity. So that means they have a loan. I don't know much about home equity loans, okay? Remember I tell you guys, if I don't know it, I don't know it. I think that means they have like a mortgage on top of a mortgage, okay? They borrowed against the house or something. Um, so he's been paying for that for the last couple years since the pandemic. The pandemic was over about two years ago. All right, so let's continue on. Well, at least a year and a half ago. Um, my question is, um, unfortunately, I think I missed the opportunity for low rates. But my question is, I still have three options. I can either continue paying the um, principal and interest, which I'm currently doing. They're covering the property taxes. That's option number one. Continue what I'm currently doing, paying $3,000 a month with that. Uh, Dang, he's paying three grand a month. He must make good money if he can afford. That's the portion of his parents. Why are you paying I your probably, parents' mortgage? Uh, yeah, that 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 too. That means he's paying thirty. 30 he's paying like thirty six a year for his parents. Holy cow, that's a lot of money. Holy cow, he's paying upwards of thirty six thousand. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, thirty. Yeah, that's a whole lot of money. Well, because they currently can't afford it, they want to stay in their house. I'm they want to stay in their house and they can't afford it. We're, we're gonna, we're just gonna hear, and we're not gonna make any judgments. The only child, and I would do and will do anything I can to pay them back for being fantastic parents and giving me an amazing child. To help them, no. No, sorry, Dave, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I'm going to jump in first here, okay, since I have control of the uh, switches. <laughs> um, no child is, sh no child should be of any age, no child should feel obligated or be obligated to, it sounds like to me, pretty much fund their parents' living as a thank you for raising them. To the tune of thirty-six thousand dollars a year. Thirty-six thousand. My parents just don't want to live in this house anymore, so they're gonna expect me to do it. I it makes me wonder if they've been such amazing parents. If they've been such amazing parents, then why aren't they why are they not able to model fiscal responsibility to their child? If you're such an amazing parent, why through your financial uh carelessness the financial decisions these parents have decided to make, what they're modeling to their child is don't ever be willing to downsize. Don't ever be willing to shift your budget. Find somebody else who will pay it. I mean, what are they really modeling to their son? We refuse to move. So when the son gets into a position where he's like, well, I don't want to have to move. I'm pretty comfortable here. Well, who are you going to find to pay for it? I'm thinking they're not the most amazing parents. At least, the, at least, um, what is it, that Stockholm Syndrome? Isn't that, forgive me if I'm wrong, isn't that the syndrome kind of where, you know, someone who abuses somebody else convinces the person that they're abusing that they're not really the abuser and that they're really in their on their side and that there have been studies that have shown they have taken them to court and they can't get the victim to speak negatively about the abuser because the victim is so messed up in the head going, but... I mean, they let me live and they gave me some food every day. And I think it's called Stockholm syndrome where somebody is convinced that the person that uh, has been over them, that authority figure over them, whether it's a parent, boss, you know, bad mate, whatever. Okay. The person over them has managed to convince their victim that uh, they're really with a great person. Because to me, if, if one of my friends said to me, Hey, Carrie, I have to pay for my parents' housing from top to bottom to the tune of nearly $3,000 a month. Okay, and this guy must be making good money because $3,000 a month, that's just for their housing? There are people who don't make that with all their bills combined. I know because I'm a school teacher. Okay? You know, their entire cost of living doesn't even total $3,000. So... When he says, oh, but I, I'm paying them back for all the great parenting, I see a big flaw in their parenting and that 
is being able to model living within one's means. They're refusing to live in one's within one's means. I'm avoid reality. Why can't they pay their mortgage? Uh, at the start of the pandemic, my um, dad had to retire, um, and um, why my. Uh, um, he was in an industry uh, that had some ageism, uh, and he just aged. Um, he was kind of forced to age out a little bit. That happens to millions and millions of people. It's not fair, and it's not right. I'll be totally honest. It's one of the reasons I went into education. Now, um, I had watched people in my 20s and early 30s be forced out of corporate jobs due to ageism. And ageism is where, you know, when she typically hit around 55, it, I've even assumed it could happen as early as 50. Okay. Once you hit that, they say, uh, we need to trade, we need to trade you in for two younger workers. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons I went into education and when I was in my early thirties, I actually asked myself, okay, where could I go where, um, you know, you could age. And you could still most likely keep your job. I mean, you got to do the job, of course, okay? But let's put that aside, okay? Your job valuations are solid, yada, yada, okay? Put that aside. But where could I go where someone would not be immediately um, on the termination block because of age? Where could I go where age could actually prove to be a benefit? And then I went, hey, my parents were generational, you know, generational family of teachers. And I went, that's where I went. Just something to consider. The, the, this was very, very thought out. For all the financial mishaps I've ever had in my life, um, I can honestly say I, I uh, is it the eight ball in um, pool? That Okay. I, I hit the eight ball. I think that's what the phrase is. Okay. I hit the eight ball when it, pl when it came to planning uh, pension retirement. But it wasn't a mistake. It was modeled for me. What these parents are doing here is modeling for their son we refuse to downsize. We need someone else to pick up the slack that we aren't going to pick up because we don't want to downsize. So son, you're it. And to me, that is abuse right there. So I said Stockholm syndrome. I mean, I understand it's not to the extreme end, but still guilt can be abuse. It makes somebody feel guilty enough. Absolutely. How old is he? Uh, he is 66. So why don't they have retirement accounts? Don't they have their, you know, and, he, and he's, he's 66. So he, he was in the day because I'm 50. So he's 10 years older. So he still was at the point where, you know, the, the economy was good. <laughs> what did he do for a living? Uh, he is a substitute teacher right now. Before he was um, in, an, in another industry, he was making. Both of my parents are in their 70s yeah. as, as professors. As, as teachers. The dad needs to be working. Couple needs to downsize. Mm -hmm. And so, that's, that's definitely an option he could, he could take. Right. So you take it. You don't stick it on your kids as they're trying to build their wealth, as they're trying to start their families or, you know, travel the world, whatever. You don't, you, you don't put that on your kids. I, you know, the one thing I got, I got to hand my parents. Okay. Uh, to, to all four, mom, dad, stepmom, stepdad. Okay the collective. Okay. Um, one thing I have to hand to them is they allowed us to, they have, okay. Cause two of them, my, my mom and my uh, stepfather have passed away, but they, uh, my parents have always allowed their children to go out and explore the world. No matter how much we may have effed it up at times. Okay. Uh, th they've allowed us to do that. They have never placed upon us that we had a financial obligation to, you know, support them. They modeled for us, you know, this is how adults live. This is how we plan for retirement. Okay. They modeled it to us. Not so much in words, like we all sat down and had a retirement discussion. We didn't do that. Okay. But it's just modeled as in my parents worked until they could retire. If it wasn't for medical reasons. Okay. They all worked. Um, they, they, they continue to live in the same house they lived in when I was uh, 15 years old. My mom and my, excuse me, my dad, my stepmom. All right. My parents didn't increase their standard of living or anything. They, they've never increased. As a matter of fact, 
usually with the kids were like, I know there was a period like, you want to get a bigger house? I'm like, nope, the farm's just fine. And today I am so grateful. They modeled that. I'm grateful they had the farm for the whole family to go to, but more so I'm grateful that they modeled to us that, you know, it's okay to stay where you're at. It's okay to call that home and you don't need to be bouncing to bigger and better all the time. And instead they've took the farm that they have and they've upgraded that. These people, th this caller, his parents, I'm sorry, dad needs to keep working. Sorry you were aged out. And I mean that sincerely. It's unfair. It's wrong. It's illegal. But, you know, all sorts of ways around the law on that. Okay. But you continue working. You don't say, you know what, I'm done working and um, I'm going to go stick it on my one child to take care of us, you know, $36,000 a year. Yeah. Um, Can you afford $3,000? I mean, this is different. Do you, do you make twenty five grand a month and this is no big deal? Um, I should probably know a month off the top of my head, but for a year it's uh, 110 it's like how old are you? Uh, twenty nine. Oh, this is this is silly. And he says these are great parents. These are great. These are the best parents ever. My parents ace him when it comes to this category. My parents aced him. I mean, I can barely get my stepmom, to, you know, to tell me you know, like. Mom, tell me, what do you need? Do you need anything? No, no, just, we're just fine here on the farm. You want something? She, she, I was honored. She, she let me buy her some trash bags not too long ago. So I got her, you know, trash bags, you know, with the pull grip handle and all that, you know, scented, only the name brand. Okay. Hefty. All right. <laughs> but I mean, trying to get my parents to allow me to go get them something, it, it's, it's, you know, it almost feels like, I don't say it feels like a battle, but they, they don't want stuff. They really just want to see their kids. That's really all they want. And you're single, I take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's single. So instead of building his wealth like he should be, exploring, you know, figuring out who he is, what he wants to do, finding the woman he wants to marry. Instead of doing that, he's taking care of his parents. You know, and I, I'm not. I, I might be jumping ahead here, but what happens when he meets the love of his life? And, and you, know, you know, she says, hey, you know, we're I'm paying thirty six thousand dollars a year to support my parents. Why are you supporting your parents? Oh, my dad just felt like retiring early. So we're not supporting them because of medical issues or reasons. No, dad just wanted to retire early. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I respect the fact that dad, you know, was. And I believe it, you know, forced out of a job due to ageism, but I don't respect it if the dad is going to lean on that as a permanent crutch as to why he should do nothing. Oh, yeah, I got, you know, booted out of my job because of ageism. So now I'm going to put it on my son and I'm going to write on that ageism excuse for the rest of my life. Which makes me then wonder, did he really lose his job because of ageism or perhaps they were just tired of him not wanting to work a little extra? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just... If he's laying it on his son as a guilt trip that, you know, he's that the son is supposed to support his parents now, does that type of thinking and behavior possibly translate into the work area? Sometimes it's just one step from, you know, the workplace to your home place. It's like people go, wow, are you like that at home? Uh, you... and, and this is titled, should I refinance to get lower payments? I don't think he should refinance. I think he should tell his parents, uh, I'll support you for this many months. I will take a slow off ramp as I decrease, decrease, decrease. And you either can stay where you're at and go broke or you need to move. You need to downsize. People downsize all the time. Live with them? I did move back at the pan during the pandemic, which is why I was happy to help them out. Um, to take a step back, Dave, this was not um, supposed to be a long-term solution. It was supposed to be temporary. Yeah, I didn't um, think But their parents got comfortable with it, and now it's become the long-term solution. To be. the intention of, of getting a, a getting new job, he was really good in his industry. He had experience. Um, and they have no it, money. Um, their combined permit is around 45 a year. They're in their 60s. So what happened to all the money they made while they were working? Don't tell me they went on cruises and all that stuff with it over the years. 
And what's the house worth? Uh, seven, seven ten. Yeah, and what do they owe on it? Uh, they owe uh, 283. Yeah. Sell the house, downsize your living. This is a $700,000 house. Now, of course, if you're talking, you know, big expensive cities, that $700,000 house, you know, could be, you know, equivalent of what my condo is at 840 square feet. But the bottom line is, the what, what I'm having an issue with is the parent's refusal to downsize. That, that That's where my issue is. It, it's refusing to downsize which is not good parenting. No, they need to sell it and buy a house for 500000 that's paid for. Thank you. Snaps for me. Yay. Yay me. Yeah. They, they, they're abusing their son. For a guy who says my parents were just so excellent, gave me the best childhood, well, they certainly are screwing him over right now, aren't they? Yeah, I said it. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a non-starter. Um, no, it is a it starter. Is a, it's a total it's a starter. starter. It's a comp- what he needs to do is he needs to uh, move out. He needs to give them a ninety-day move out. Parents, I'm moving out in ninety days. I would call up the realtor and start uh, making plans. Okay, if he wanted to be really generous, I mean, like he hasn't already been generous, he moves out. I tell him to move out even sooner. And have him say, you know what, over the next six months, I'm going to start cutting down the budget by a third, a third, and a third. He's paying 3000 a month, so over three months or six months, cut it down by 1500 bucks a month. You know, be respectful, you know, if that e- eases his conscience. But right now, all I see, to some, to me, somewhat, are parents who have turned abusive. Not physically abusive, but up here abusive, psychologically. There's no reason for their son to be paying for this. Oh, you're my one son. So it's your job to take on the family, okay? That's bal- that's just baloney. Plate starter. Total starter. The non-starter is this dysfunctional crap that you're weaving that is your life. See, th- uh, thank you, Dave, for saying that. What this guy doesn't realize is he is being abused. He is. Financial abuse. He just, his parents have convinced him that they were excellent with him. That's what his parents have convinced him about. So he buys it. But are they not abusing him? Doesn't abuse come in many different ways? Why is he not in his own place, exploring his own world? Parents call up, hey, son, mom and I have decided to downsize. You know, your, your papa here, he's uh, decided he doesn't want to go back to work anymore. Um, you know, I'm still working a little bit. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to sell the house. Don't worry. We're, we're not moving far away from you and our upcoming grandkids. Yada, yada. Okay, that's the way the conversations are supposed to go. In healthy relationships. That's the non-starter. The non-starter is that a 29-year-old is taking care of these fully capable adults who need to get off their butts and take care of themselves. Um, It is not an act of love. Thank you. Thank you. And I would feel very, very, very differently if we were talking medical concerns here. Very differently. But even so, I still wouldn't want him living at home. But if you had to live at home, hopefully there was like a mother-in-law suite, you know, separated, you know, so the, I mean, I, I, I can respect that. I can respect that. Okay. You know what? We have a mother-in-law suite, you know, we built one, we converted something, you know, and you know, the parents live there, you know, and we're here, you know, there, there's been a major medical issues going on strokes, things like that. I get that. But just dad just doesn't want to work anymore. And dad's going to ride the crutch of, oh, they aged me out. There is so much weirdness going on behind the scenes in this conversation. I can't breathe. Especially it's some sort of return on investment as though they were great parents. And so they're entitled to X percent of your, of your income because they don't want to work. And it is my opinion. Okay. The son got this idea from whom? Who did he get this idea from? His parents. His parents gave him this idea. I told you, Stockholm Syndrome. I have never, ever had my parents come up to me and say, you know, Carrie, um, we've raised you, we fed you. God knows that airplane ticket, you know, from Saigon, Vietnam to here. Whoo, you owe us some on that one. A- and the outfit that you threw up on also. You know, you owe us a refund on that one when you were on the airplane. Okay, so you owe us and then lick their fingers and they tabulate the amount. All right, when you get older and you clear all those bankruptcies you got and student loan debt, you start owing us. 
You start owing us. My parents would never do that. These are not the great parents that this son thinks they are. These parents have convinced the, their, their one and only son that he is responsible for their uh, financial lifestyle. I didn't say well-being, but it's their desired financial lifestyle. Yeah, or they didn't save up, or they made some life choices. I'm all about helping your parents out, man. Well, but this let's is, pretend that this you had a job that was making twenty thousand dollars a year, and you were in an apartment, uh, and they were in this pickle. You know what they would do? They would sell their house and buy a five hundred thousand dollar house and get a job to be able to live there. That's what they would do. So it's not a non-starter. Uh, you are trying to make their fantasy world exist, and it's not sustainable. And. You and they're guilting him to make it exist. He got this idea from his parents. I swear, this didn't just come from him. And we're not talking just, hey, let me move home for the pandemic. But the whole idea, the whole expansion of you owe it to me because you were great parents. Somewhere or another, he got that idea. And I genuinely don't believe he just got that from himself. It's It, it, was, it was hinted. It was clued. You know, he, he's gotten hints of it all along until he came up with the conclusion of, hey, you know what? I should pay my parents $36,000 a year. H, what is it? Mortgage bill and all of that home equity loan because they were such wonderful parents. He got that idea from someone he got it from his parents. You are a, a participating in the fantasy as though the fantasy that you can prop them up and keep this thing going forever. You there, th this is, has such a short runway, and it's gonna, then it's going to hit the wall, and it's going to disintegrate like NASCAR, and the engine's going to fly up in the stands. I mean, this is... And then, what's it going to do to the relationship when he can't sustain it? You know how Dave always says, you know, don't mix your family with money? Well, that, well that's a heck of a mix. Hey, I'm going to support you totally. I'm going to support all your housing. When he says, don't mix your money with your family, this is, this is a great example. Because who are the parents going to blame? I mean, if this kid wants to talk about guilt, okay? If this kid wants to, oh, you know, that, well, what, what is it? They should, um, you know, I need to pay for their stuff because they were such great parents. Okay, if, if you want to talk guilt, how is this kid going to feel when he can't sustain his parents' living because they were such great parents? How's this kid going to feel when he himself goes broke? Cause he's maxed out his debts. Okay. He has no more you know, room on the credit card. What's going to happen to the, Oh, they were just such perfect parent relationship between parent and child. Who's going to blame whom ultimately to me, it's the parents responsibility. But when he can't and, or he doesn't want to maintain this anymore, what's that going to do to that so-called perfect relationship? This, this is, you got about two to three years on this before the, all the emotions in this mess melt down and the, and the finances unravel. So this is not a refinance question. This is a, uh, Peter, you've made some, you guys have made a mistake of trying to, you were nice to come in and, and with an umbrella when it was raining, but an umbrella is not a structure right. that's sustainable in a, in a monsoon and you're, they, so these folks need to make some decisions about their income and their housing like grown-ups. And then you need to go on and love them, be kind to them, and you can assist them occasionally. But this idea that you took them to raise is just dysfunctional, dude. That's yeah. the non-starter. Yeah, and this is what the guy needs to um, be able to understand that that is, if that's the way they actually present it to him, that's abuse in itself. He doesn't have the perfect parents. Far from it. All right, folks. That was story number two. I'm Carrie. This is Student Loan Chit Chat. I would like to thank you for joining me this Sunday evening for bedtime story and chit chat. I hope you guys will consider subscribing. You guys have yourselves a terrific Sunday night. Bye.